Swinburne University of Technology. I'm here today interviewing Associate Professor Deirdre Barron for the PhD Hub. Deirdre is an expert researcher in the area of design and she's just come back from an invitation to talk about setting up PhD design courses in Malaysia, Taiwan, India, China, is that That's it? That's correct. And today we're going to talk about the PhD in design, the, how it was traditionally, perhaps other alternatives, and how it's evolving, <coughs> where it's going, and what how Deirdre sees that PhD uh, as a dynamic contribution to knowledge. So Deirdre, what was your task in India, China, Taiwan, Malaysia, and <laughs> well, <Wherever else. laughs> all those places. Um, probably coming off what is perceived as a success in doctoral research at Swinburne, um, those countries that are looking to develop those programs, they've been delivering up to the master's level. But as they embark on the, um, the PhD, they're looking at new models of what might be appropriate for a, PH, uh, for a design PhD as opposed to maybe mathematics or astrophysics and all the STEM projects. Well, this PhD hub is for prospective and early PhD students as well as ongoing yeah. and supervisors. So that's very appropriate for them. Uh, looking at first, perhaps, or what was the traditional, was there a traditional design PhD? Um, and is there? It, it, well, is there? Um, PhDs in design globally are very new. It's, one of the, it's probably the newest field of um, academic endeavour. It has roots in engineering, art, business, so it's a more of an um, integrated. But of course, the vehicle that they're looking at for that are um, visual or practical artifacts. So there's a the lived environment, um, the designed environment. Yes. So um, it has drawn very heavily on traditional research methods in a sense: sociology, psychology, um, business, um, engineering, but in a different way because it's you know, experts in those areas. So it's a new field. They gave us the opportunity to maybe envisage that slightly different. But the original supervisors across the world have obviously then been from those other fields. Yeah. So in design globally, it's um, still contentious and still highly discussed because some people are coming from engineering, some are coming from sociology, some, you know, and those people will all have a different view on what constitutes valid research in any field. But if you're looking at a new area, you can say, how might it be different? That's right. And I, don't, and I actually think established fields could learn a lot from what you can discover in new fields because um, for me it was like, and I come from education, so I don't come from des design, is how might education layer on to those questions of doctoral supervision um, that would make a, um, a more enhanced and more successful and a more pleasant experience for doctoral students. What has surprised me in doctoral education is the lack of educational theory bringing into what I call the highest level of education. So you have to be qualified to, in teaching for early childhood, primary, secondary, but you do not have to be mm. to be a university lecturer and you certainly don't have to be to be a supervisor. But there are many things we can learn from educational pedagogy and educational experience that could actually overcome some what I would say extreme shortcomings in traditional doctoral education. I think that a country like Australia that only has a 50% completion rate should be ashamed of the 50% failure rate. Mm. And where universities are applauding their 65% completion rate, I look at the 35% failure rate. So what do you see these shortcomings as being, perhaps, or some of them? Yeah. In most cases, the doctoral training, it's delivered as if a content expert can deliver all those necessary things for learning. And learning is much more than content. And so the thesis has become the, uh, the, the, the concentrated effort. Rather, And my thing is, in doctoral training, your people are not just getting a thesis, they are learning to be doctoral. And in learning to be doctoral, there are many other things other than the thesis that count. There is the way you engage with the world, your colleagues, an approach to work, an understanding of ethics, um, project management. You can list numerous mm. um, elements that we're learning. The artifact is what gets, which is the thesis, is what gets examined, but it's supposed to demonstrate that you know all those other things. 
And there's a belief almost that a student in isolation that can meet with a supervisor once a week, if you're lucky, somehow learns all those things that they could learn from a greater community. So, and there's many educational theories you could apply. In my case, I look at communities of practice and zones of proximal development, which says that a doctoral student will learn most by engaging with the whole professorate or the whole academic collegiate. That they need to be, and this is why your hub sounds exciting, where they need to be where they can talk to people outside of the one-on-one -on -one supervision. So you're breaking down those kind of silos of design being here, other areas being there, sociology and so forth. Yeah. And that it's just, the trouble is with one-on-one, -on -one, your supervisor you know, takes their annual leave, they go overseas, like in my case, who you know, the student has to get to know someone else. But if they're talking to everybody, they're learning from everybody, it also in, sh in a way protects the student from just replicating what the supervisor wants. I mean, I was very influenced by a paper that the Department of Education put out in 2001. It's a great one, it's only four pages. But it lists under like five or six categories about 32 reasons that students don't have a satisfactory experience of supervision. It's called factors that affect PhD completion, I think. And the, most of those can become overcome um, in ways that don't add time. Everyone thinks every time you add something, it has to take more time. But if you look at things in a, um, as a whole, rather than over here for language, over here for methodology, over here for writing, which I think does add time, if you bring groups together and students can talk to each other and they can talk to other supervisors, all those things can be done at the same time. They're not separate. Your writing is not separate to your reading is not separate. Mm. You know, your reading, your writing, your thinking and your discussions all occur at the same time. It only adds time when you have to, because we're siloing off learning. We're sort of saying that these things don't interconnect. And I also find if the effort is put in at the start, where students learn academic language, appropriate ways to write, they're learning, you know, if their grammar is wrong, learn those things in the first six months. It's like teaching a person to fish. They are actually capable of doing those things themselves rather than having supervisors spend hours and hours correcting and editing. Mm huge documents at the end. Much easier to work on systemic issues on a thousand words than correct a hundred thousand words. So this is a community of practice and it's particularly, I guess, while it's appropriate for all students, it would be particularly appropriate for people living away from home, for international students living in Australia, I guess. Absolutely too. Well, part of it is that you, that you by having lots of people to connect with, isolation is one of the big factors that right. affect all students. Absolutely for international students. I mean, even on my trip, as you're saying, I've been around these places. And, you know, I'm going there as, I suppose, an expert, so I'm looked after very well. There is still an isolating experience of not being able to go and have a cup of tea yeah. with a friend or, you know. Just understand what's going on around Now, imagine you come into what is a, the PhD is a very foreign experience. And, um, you know, everyone thinks they're not worthy. So you're already scared. You don't know people. If you've only got your supervisor, the two supervisors to talk to, the isolation must be extreme for many international students. By bringing into a group, even physically, even if you're not doing the program, even physically being co-located and being able to talk to people can break down that isolation. If you can get rid of that biggest barrier to successful completion, even mental health, there's so many issues bound up with students being able to meet each other. So you, you see the contemporary PhD is moving away from that traditional isolated model. Does that alter what's produced? Oh yes, to the betterment. Yeah. In what ways then would the contemporary PhD be quite different from or complementary to from the traditional model? <sighs> okay, it's not an either or. So the traditional, there are many Okay, traditional model. I don't think you're ever going to move away from an examinable outcome. No. There has to be a way for knowledge to be transferred, to be judged, to be there for the collective of other people to build on. And we do that even within our own research. Of yes. course, all of our own research is evaluated Absolutely. by peer review journal, and all those. Peer review, so, so all those things have to happen. But 
in the immediacy of research, it is in the, what you might say, the conference or the talking, your colleagues, where the tensions and differences are created. So you've got to learn to talk and you've got to learn to exchange immediately as well as the artefact. I think the doctorate will have more and more um, connection to how are people integrating within their field, not just how they're writing a book. And how are they building their alumni that gives genuine international um, this is the one that I, I, I think has not been dealt with. We say that it's an international experience to have an international student come here or for a Western academic or student to go elsewhere. It's not. When I went to these places, I was not bringing an international experience to those universities. I was a foreigner teaching in, a, in their culture. Yes. International experience for international students coming here is not that they come and get taught by foreigners. An international experience is for us to get to know them and them to get to know us and to build genuine collegial relationships that will extend well beyond the PhD. That's becoming doctoral. And I think the successful programs in the future will put a lot of attention into how you create these connections that last a lifetime rather than for three painful or five painful years. And to me, the five years becomes, it takes five years because the isolation slows down the ability to write, right. because talking helps you do that. So to me, the new ways of doing PhDs and under the funding pressures and everything will have to adapt, is a growth in the understanding that people talking to each other speeds up communication, your ability to write it. Speaking words out loud has a psychological factor, you know, it actually cognitive capacity to actually help you formulate the words to explain yourself. And that sits very well with the new notions of big data and wicked problems, of uh, areas of research which don't have a singular focus, which don't have a singular outcome, doesn't it? Yes. And with people coming from non-traditional backgrounds, do you deal with people who come from outside the academy? Yes, and, um, and it was experimental to start with, I suppose, that in design, as you say, because it hadn't been an established academic field. It was um, a practice-based field, not in the, in the institutions. That practitioners coming back to work, so they might have had a, well, had to have a bachelor degree, but they were working probably in yeah. industry and believed they couldn't write. Um, and so the pressure to only do an artifact was great because it's like this was foreign. But to, I think, everyone's surprise is given the right support, they can communicate in words as well as um, other non-traditional outputs that are associated with that. They can be successful and they can learn to talk with other academics in other field. And I think this is the danger. If we just go for non-traditional PhDs, we end up endorsing silos because if people don't learn to speak the language of other disciplines, we will never have truly interdisciplinary fields. That it's a bit like um, sitting in a room with a foreign speaker, you know, you do a bit of charades, but you can't really communicate. Someone has to have words that we can exchange those ideas. So as I think the world becomes more interdisciplinary, the teams become interdisciplinary, and if the person's not, there is no point to that team if you're not being able to understand each other. And you see this constantly where, um, you know, say engineering cannot understand the more creative talk mm, mm. of some disciplines. Um, psychology doesn't understand sociology or, you know, because they're talking, one ex, you know, expresses much more about experience, another one is what you can measure of, you know, brain capacities or whatever. Um, how do you then have a conversation where the knowledge from those fields really actually starts to make headway and understanding in those tensions between the fields? Um, and that's where the Faculty of Health, Arts and Design offers opportunities, doesn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. And I'm hoping that this contributes slightly to that opportunity, that people can see a large number of scholars from very different backgrounds and very different research activities who nevertheless understand what it is to do a PhD, have ideas and insights yeah, into yeah. it, and the student can garner various things from various people. And absolutely, I mean, I think that um, one of the difficulties though is an institution that rewards individual effort against rewarding collegial yes. um, engagement. So I find most academics are really engaging. I'll give one example. I have a, one of my current PhD students working in the area of feminism, which I do do a lot of work in. But, you know, I've been grateful that 
she's been able to go to academics in the other elements of the faculty, so in the arts or whatever, humanities, and join in their discussion groups. So mm. we have some of the feminist researchers who are engaging with her. Um, she's gone off to RMIT and met with some people there who work in design and feminism. And so that was an ex-PhD student, but she's engaged there. And what I can be really confident on is when I'm talking to that student about the bringing together of her ideas and steering that, that she's not replicating me. She's got mm. all these other influences and she brings an intelligent conversation. Then we can talk about, not whether it's right or wrong, but how might you now consolidate this into an argument that you want to make. I have actually relied then on the generosity of these people to do that because there's no reward for them. That's right. Well, I've relied on the generosity of you and people mm -hmm. to do this PhD hub. And the, I think the, the reward is our own st standing and understanding of our professional responsibilities and our willingness to share our knowledge. Mm. And as you've indicated, there are many groups within every university that have public lectures or group activities yes. that people can join in and uh, reinforce or discover mm. new ideas. Absolutely. And I, I mean, and I know myself when I first came to Swinburne, and hopefully it can start again, is where you could go to a lunchtime seminar, and yes. I would go to ones in engineering or um, love the ones in philosophy, and you would learn something that you may not use, but it sparks an understanding of your own field, even though it seems so distant. That's right, yes. So the mm. contemporary PhD for you is getting out of the silo, yes. looking at various ways of interpreting uh, the ways in which design operates, does it also mean that the actual finished thesis will look different, do you think? <sighs> I actually think that's the uh, sorry, an almost irrelevant question. That's because fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, there must always be something that can be examined by someone and it should be appropriate yes. for the examination. Um, but the student could argue of various models. They could, but I would say that th we could be... Changing it too much may put too much pressure on a student to come up with an idea of how it might be different. Yeah, right. Certainly my thing is any intelligent person looking at a PhD or a, an artifact can say, yes, I understand this or I don't understand this. There is an ease of understanding though, <coughs> which I struggle with because I, I know what you're sort of getting at, but if I'm asked to examine, there's a there's certain elements that we want to know people have learned. Yes. And so a traditional outlay of a thesis, whether it's five chapters, eight chapters. Enables words, examination. Well, enables my, no, it's scaffolded for me. Right, yeah. As a person, when I engage in examination, I'm learning too. And when it's in a sort of almost traditional format, I can understand I'm dealing with these particular sections. So for the writer, it could be in various methods, but for the reader who's foreign, Mm. to the content, you need some familiarity to make it so you can understand it. So and it's a bit like that language. Markers, really. Yes. Yeah. And so how do, so to ensure that you can engage this discussion with the examiner, because examination to me, I don't know, is, is not about finding someone wrong. It's can I engage in a sensible discussion with the ideas put forward. And most examiners are wanting well, to Absolutely, I'll say that. Yeah. And every examination of any student I've had I just think it's wonderful that the engagement that comes back and from examiners. And you get terrific reports back and they tell you exactly what to well, do if you have to do Well, most of the ones, so they actually great. do take it seriously about engaging in a debate That's with right. a student, That's not right. in a criticism, yeah. in a critique and a, and a suggestive way. And, yeah. and I love that part. But they can do that because there's this familiar sort of... So I think there are possibilities undiscovered, but breaking totally to make it so unfamiliar that someone can't engage it, I think could be worrisome, but I don't know where that could lead. Yes, yes. Um, I know that where I have looked at ones that are, say, an exhibition and then someone talks about it, I find that I'm less able to engage it. And that could just be me. Mm. But I do worry if we go too far in that non-traditional approach that we actually disenfranchise the student from an engagement in a wider academic debate. So to me, the artifact that is examined is only examining that they can identify a problem, that they're not reinventing the wheel, that it's significant, they do some rigorous research, and that can be, and I don't mean number crunching, I think it can be a whole wide range, and that they, from that engagement with the research, 
come up with a reasonable analysis that can guide us to think and interpret the world in different ways. Those things then, if they're done in that sort of sequence, sort of start to look like a traditional model. But, and are we really helping a student? I know I've sort of struggled with this, and so I don't know right or wrong here. I know, so I can only say from my struggle, if for a student, a student um, had trouble writing, could they do it verbally? Well then one of the great skills is being able to communicate things writing. I would rather see more resources to overcome the to issue, help with it, yes. to help with that, than to leave them forever struggling yes. with that component. Because well, I, I think you've raised a really important point there that the PhD is not the end. Oh, it's the first indication that you can undertake it's a, driver's a major, license. That's exactly right, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, a major yeah. research project that you can drive it, that you can understand yes. it, that you can articulate it. So whilst you're doing thing, it you know, or whilst yeah. you're starting it, yeah. you think, my God, that's the top of the mountain. Yeah. But you get to the top of the mountain and you're not even you're in the, the foothills. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I've just gone up from the beach. Yeah, so those sorts of things. But what you want students to always do is, and I think the most empowering thing is to actually give students the skills to engage with the wider community of scholars. and. So my big criticism of traditional PhD programs and the traditional approach to just it being about the thesis is that we've taught people that that is the be all and end all. That the publication of a paper is the be all and end all or getting the grant is the be all and end all. When in fact the discussion and the engagement and the real identification of problems that count and then being able to find out of the multitude of methods a range of appropriate ones or the one you might do the becoming doctoral to me is far more important than the thing we concentrate on. And if someone becomes doctoral, the thesis will almost write itself in whatever mode it is. So when the discussion's about how might the PhD examinable outcome be different, we're going down the track of concentrating on the examinable outcome, not on the learning that a student will engage with as they become doctoral. Well, Deirdre, becoming doctoral is a very significant <laughs> part, of course, of undertaking the PhD journey. That's what it's about, just to, to get you to those foothills. And Deirdre has put forward very many interesting ideas about the dynamism of the PhD journey, the dynamism of the PhD model. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>